Um, Don Nicholson, uh, Connor English, members of the National Board, Provincial Presidents and Leaders of Federated Farmers. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you as officers and spokesperson on agriculture. I'm very conscious of the fact that you've had a pretty hefty morning and I'm standing between you and your lunch. Can I also acknowledge the generous comments that I've received from many farmers over the last few months. I've always been confident in the future of New Zealand's agricultural industries. You have to be, of course, as a New Zealander, because agriculture is intrinsic to our economy's strength and our economic, social and environmental success, or failure. It's been the backbone of our economy for most of our economic history because of our competitive advantage as a farming nation. But while I'm confident, I'm realistic as well. And you've just seen some of the reasons for realism on the screen. There are a number of issues we need to deal with. Farm profitability is uncertain in stormy international economic conditions. There are broad risks in the financial strength of the agricultural sector. Global awareness about environmental impacts and animal welfare are forcing change in our markets and changing uh, the business environment, as well as affecting the raw materials that farming depends on, like climate and water. I'm glad you're meeting here in Auckland because it emphasises that the prosperity even of our largest city is dependent on the performance of our farmers. I've always believed that the engine room of the New Zealand economy is in provincial New Zealand, not in the major cities. And I think the fact that we've done so well in the last eight or nine years is uh, a very clear indicator of that. Agriculture is as relevant to Queen Street as it is to Hokitika, Manawatu, to Geraldine or to Carpenter. For that matter, the services that cities can provide are also, of course, crucial to our primary industries. In my hometown, Christchurch, some of the most innovative scientists in New Zealand are rivaled only by their contemporaries in cities like Palmerston North and Hamilton in their research contributions to New Zealand. Of course, there's always a risk that our economic backbone will be ignored in public debate about our economy. At the start of this year, when the then new government opened its year in Parliament with a speech from the throne, the word agriculture did not get a mention. It was the first time, at least a decade, in my view, that farming was ignored. There is not much chance of developing the right policies for the agricultural sector when farming isn't even on the radar screen of a speech from the throne. The policy environment in Wellington today, like every capital around the world right now, is occupied with the difficult global economic environment. Many developed countries are in recession. Some of them are in deep recession. We can take some comfort that demand for food holds up better in a recession than demand for cars from General Motors or Chrysler. But we can't be too comfortable. Reduced demand around the world is likely to result in reduced prices for our exports, and ultimately that means that incomes will fall. And because the same reduced prices affect farmers everywhere, that is across the globe, we can expect farmers in every country to redouble their efforts to increase productivity and production because this lowers costs per unit of output, and that's not to even mention the subsidies that have been reintroduced in many countries. And since every farm around the world is in the same situation, total production will increase with prices falling and demand increasing only very slowly. On top of that, there is input price pressure. One of the critical elements in soil fertility is nitrogen. Industrial fertiliser is produced from gas or coal, and the price of fossil fuels is high. Persistent increases in the price of oil and gas would lead to higher fertiliser costs, so you get the higher input costs at the same time as reduced demand. Hand in hand with that picture, we can expect to see rising protectionism, as we are seeing in many markets, particularly in agriculture, so that makes market access even more difficult. This is a tough recipe for farmers. There are only two ways to increase farm profitability that I know about, reducing the cost of inputs or increasing the value of production from given inputs. A combination of both strategies is, in my view, inevitable. 
The underlying trend in export prices for our commodity agricultural products is down over the long term. With some medium term exceptions, such as China's expansion and climate events, prices for agricultural exports have been under long term downward pressure. The strong expansion of China in recent years has helped to push up the prices of many raw materials, including some that farmers compete for, such as energy, while also increasing the price for agricultural products. But relying on that to continue forever is not a prudent long-term strategy for farming or for New Zealand. At the same time that we are confronting the difficult environment for farm prices, agricultural finance is under stress as well. You have to be optimistic to be a banker, don't you? Just heard that stuff. This is what I would call a perfect storm. Input price rises, threats to demand, and financial risk. I've been looking at New Zealand's accounts with the rest of the world. You've seen some of them on the graphs you just have presented. When you look at our merchandise trade, our exports against our imports, the deficit is large but manageable. But we face a massive deficit in one crucial area. The slide was flicked across the screen but just started to work out how long it takes to repay that. We have been using the savings of people in other countries instead of our own earnings or our own savings to pay for our lifestyle. And the bill for that is starting to come in. How much do you think New Zealand is sent overseas each year to the owners of our large commercial banks? In the 90s, we sent overseas about $3 billion a year in profit and interest on loans extended to New Zealand banks. For the first half of this decade, it was stable at around $4 billion a year. So it went from three to four billion. But something dramatic has happened. And the truth is I don't know exactly what the answer is. And I'm trying to find out. And a lot of people I'm asking don't know what the answer is either, which is rather strange. The banking system has begun repatriating enormous amounts of New Zealand money. Last year, calendar year 2008, the banks repatriated not $3 billion overseas, not $4 billion overseas, but $11.7 billion in profit and interest paid on loans. That is, the New Zealand branches paid their overseas owners $11.7 billion in interest and profit. I should best be reminded that eight or nine years ago it was $3 billion. It's risen to $11.7. Something extraordinary is going on here. The total has risen from 3.8 billion in 2000 to 11.7 billion last year. That's more than the entire GST revenue of New Zealand. It's more than the entire education budget. And Jack O'Reilly is talking about that. <coughs> and in a single year, it's far more than the entire proceeds of the asset sales program that caused so much pain through the 80s and 90s, which was meant to end all of this. Behind this enormous repatriation of New Zealand's money is a serious balance of payments deficit. It now stands at $16,000 million, the current account for last year, about 9% of GDP. That's money that we borrowed and we have to pay back in one year. In other words, our total overseas debt increased by $16 billion last year alone. Debt like this is easy to run up, but it's damn hard to pay back. And that chart showing the trend of, of international investment shows you how hard it is. It poses a risk for agriculture specifically. Total bank lending to agriculture in April this year was $43.7 billion, or 13.8% of the total amount of money lent in New Zealand. Two thirds of that is lending to the dairy industry, at a time when one estimate says Fonterra could be first forced to cut its payment from the current $4.55 if our dollar stays at over 60 US cents. This would be very hard on some farming businesses that thought the last couple of years of high prices would last longer than they had. Relief from interest rates would help, of course. As Federated Farmers Lachlan McKenzie pointed out yesterday, every cent drop or every 1% drop in interest you pay on the debt you currently